Everybody, good morning. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host Anne, and disembodied hands Justin, who is somewhere out there in the ether. How is everybody doing this morning? Thursday. We are almost to the weekend. We are almost to the weekend, and that makes me happy. I know this week went really fast, didn't it, D. Clearman? Really fast. Hey, freestyle. Been a while since I've seen you. Hello. I hope you're doing well. Yeah. Oh, Crowley, you're slow today. <laughs> Delayed, drawn out hamster. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 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 Hey, Catnap. All right. So I'm going to play with something right out the gate because I was curious about whether it would work. So I'm going to mess around a little bit and then we'll do some paint. But uh, I was thinking about the crystal for the top of her staff that I wanted to put there. And I was like, well, you know, I could steal a crystal from something. I could sculpt it out of green stuff. Or I could see if I could start it on plastic card and just flush it out with green stuff. So I cut out a couple of little tiny plastic cards. Um, this is really thick plastic card. It's uh, sheet styrene. It's about one point. Uh, as you can see, it's quite thick. It's 1.5 millimeters thick. I like this stuff for uh, if I have to build out a base to be bigger. Um, and I want a solid surface. You used to use them for movement trays back in the wargaming days because it was nice, big, but um, you can cut styrene really easily on an angle as you can, let's see here, kind of see how I'm cutting it on an angle. So it occurred to me that I could uh, probably shape a really rough crystal doing this. I don't know if I want something that big, but I'm going to go for it anyway and see what I can do. Hey, love, how's it going? Do -do. I am uh, slicing up plastic card to try to make a crystal for the top of her staff. Unfortunately, to, in order to have the 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 uh, leverage, I need to like mess with my angle here. So, when I cut this, I actually used a side cutters and I left the angle that it made. But you can see that you can easily shave with the side of your knife to kind of get uh, the shape you want. And I'm kind of working off of some of the flaws I've already got in my cutting. Like I can see, I've got a flat side starting here, so I'm going to accentuate that. Because ideally, I want this to be much thinner, so I'm going to work with work with it to narrow it. My um, my hope is that this is going to be far faster. I'm going to get in focus with my tiny piece of plastic card. Oh, no, no, no. It likes to focus on the card when it can see it. It loves those letters. Yes, indeed, we have we have almost Friday. This is this is not Thursday. This is almost Friday, right? Right? So now I'm going to trim up the top. I want it to be sharper on top. So I'm going to kind of gouge. And I'm not really, I don't really have a shape in mind. I'm just like, let's see how this is going to look. I just know I want it narrower to the top. So now we've got some nice bevel action going on. But I still want it to be more, um, I want it to be a little, I, see this is where you could take green stuff and build it up on one side to make it thicker once you've got the shape you want. Yeah, that's true. It's Leaper, Reaper Live Day. Leaper Live. <laughs> you can ask Ed how it's all going down there. I'm sure everyone is buried. Between the Kickstarter fulfillment and planning for ReaperCon, I am sure that it is, as usual, a crazy time. It's always crazy days at Reaper. So where I see flaws in the plastic, I'm just going to use the side of my knife and kind of scrape, just like you would on a styrene model. You can use the back or the or a dull blade to um, to kind of scrape down flaws in your plastic card. <laughs> yeah, Valander. We never cry on camera. Come on. We may be crying inside, but we never cry on camera because we're hashtag almost professional. Almost professionals never cry on camera. Okay, unless it gets them like more views. If having Ed cry on camera, I still think Ed wouldn't cry on camera. I don't think he wants the views that much. He's got enough of you. He's got enough of you with his giveaways where he gives away half the company. All right. So I've got a bunch of facets going on now. And I've got the top. The top is shaping up, but I want it to come to more of a point. I've got kind of this area here that's not 
quite cutting where I want it. Mostly I'm just trying to do like, almost like you're sharpening a pencil, right? With, uh, with just your knife. In the olden days, those who remember that, I guess nowadays that's like ridiculous. Everybody uses mechanical pencils, unless you're drawing or something, right? Unless you're doing some of those arch archaic art forms. So I'm just slowly going to work on all the angles I've already got now to deepen them so I can bring the top of the crystal to a point. My hope is, again, that doing my, my crystal this way will be much faster than trying to just sculpt it from scratch. It's also going to be a lot stronger. And the great thing is, it's thick enough that with my tiny pin vise, I can pin into it. So I can pin it to the top of the staff, and it'll be durable. So really, for me, when I thought of this, I was like, that's a win-win if I can get the crystal to be the right shape that I want. And I don't really mind if it's a little bit longer than it is um, as far as its thickness. Like, I don't... Since she's a very two-dimensional figure, so okay, here we go. So if she was a more rounded figure, like she had stuff going on from her side angles, like if she was in a really dynamic pose, then it would pay to make sure that my crystal was maybe thicker and not quite so thin. But because she is very much, she's got two good viewing angles. She's got this good viewing angle and the back. So obviously we need to do some freehand, right? Um... But because of this, then I only need really a, and that almost looks like a, a spear, which I actually really like. And look, it fits right between the little horns. So they're like holding it in. I was like, maybe I don't like that. And then I was like, oh, wait, maybe I do like that. So that's actually working really well. I like it. Um, I'm going to, I see a flaw there and I need to trim out the bottom a little bit, chip out the bottom a little bit. I don't want it to be that perfect flatness. Anyway, we can thank Bob Rodolfi for this because um, Bob loves to work in styrene and uh, he makes me think of it sometimes like because he likes to work in styrene. I w I f but, but for Bob Rodolfi, I would not have thought of using styrene for this. Let's just put it that way. But it is terribly easy to work with and it's kind of fun. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, Cookie. Well, and it's a magical crystal staff, so it probably is like, you know, has some wicked superpowers too, you know. So it's both her mage focus and a weapon, which, if you think about it, makes perfect sense for a half-orc, doesn't it? So I'm going to keep this. I'm going to sharpen up her spear blade a little bit then. Still going to paint it like a crystal. but I, And this is where it gets a little hard, because you need to put leverage on it to slice it down. I don't really want to use a file at this point. I want this sharp, sharp edge. I could probably use sanding sticks, but that would take a long time. So it's better if I can nail it with the knife, in my opinion, on this. Hey, Trouble! Trouble's been with us for 15 months. Well, okay, if you count Ed, Trouble's been with us a lot longer. But, but this particular form of Trouble. Yeah, your ears are burning. <laughs> yes, blame Bob for me reaching for styrene. I decided to make a crystal, uh, Bob and Julie. And because of Bob's love for styrene and like how much fun he makes it look like, I decided to actually carve my crystal out of styrene. At least as a starting point, but I'm really liking how it's coming out. So I've decided to make it into kind of a crystal magical spear tip for her staff. Because for a half orc, it makes sense that her magical mage staff would also be a weapon. So I'm just trying to get my facets right and nice and smooth. And also sharpen up the tip just a tad more. Right now she looks like she's stabbing somebody with a blunt pencil and we don't want that. We want to narrow that down. And yes, I'm cutting toward myself. Just don't even. My knife is really, actually really dull. I keep my knives dull because I know I like to do things like this. So that I don't impale myself. Don't try this at home, kids. I'm going to just try to, there we go, sharpen it up just a little bit. So do not do this with a very sharp knife, obviously, or your, uh, Thumb will begin to look like slicey, which, you know, I've done to myself in the past, but that's a little better. That's a little better. I like that. Yeah, pokey pokey crystal stabby of doom, right? Why not? Um, but yeah, so I thought I would get out my 1.5 millimeter thick plastic card and see if I could get a good start on it. And I didn't originally mean for it to be this wide, but then it fits really well. It fits so well in there between the horns of her staff that I really like that. So now I need to, um, 
I'm going to shape the bottom of it just a little. I do want to suggest that the bottom is not completely flat, but I don't want to deform it too much because it fits in there so well right now. So I need to make sure that I bevel it very gently. Probably just on the edges. And so you want some good control. You want to go slow. Obviously, I'm not going super fast on this. I'm figuring out where my placement is. I'm pressing. I'm carving. There's no hurry. That's why this is fun, because it's relaxing. You're kind of like just chipping away at it here and there until you figure out if you like it. There, that's a little bit more irregular on the base. I'm going to look at the shape of the flat here. I think I like this front. This is the front, I think. All right. Let's try that in there. It looks pretty good. I like the scale. It gives her some height, which I feel like she needed. So now we have we have changed the composition of model with this. Because instead of just this being the highest point of the, of the staff, and it's like, you know, kind of the same as her hair, we've elevated it. And now we have a nice diagonal line going this way, right? The top, and then her head, and then the potion bottle, and her hand, technically. So we can now draw a diagonal line on the top of the figure. It makes her a lot more dynamic. Ah, if I use a single edge razor blade. Yeah, that makes sense. But my fingers are so used to this, Julie and Bob. <laughs> like, you could almost see. Like, I bet if you got really close to my thumb, you could see all the tiny lines that have built up over the years. Like, if I have any calluses on my fingers, it's entirely my knife-cutting thumb. <laughs> so, again, don't try this at home, kids. But I, I do have some uh, serious uh, slight slicey marks. The most I've ever done is just, like, a, a very light skin cut. But, yes, it's not the most safe way to do it. Listen to Bob and Julie. If you use a nice, sharp, single-edge blade, you can uh, cut into a cutting mat, which is what we're all supposed to do. Do as I say, not as I do. Um, I've only ever had a, had a knife accident that uh, drew blood. And it was because I was working on something that was way too big to be using a knife on, really. I should have been using a jeweler's saw. But I was impatient. <laughs> Yeah, like I say, do as I say, not as I do, Pendrake. This is just the way I've gotten used to doing it. Yes, it's hazardous. No, don't do it at home, kids. I'm going to actually flatten off. I'm going to take a file and flatten off the top of this little nubby on top of her staff so that I can uh, pin this on. Then we could actually have it in place, which is exciting. I'll get out my pin vise, which always has my tiny drill bit, um, and my appropriately sized wire, which is 0.51 millimeters. This is, a, this is a number 75 drill bit, which is 0.5 millimeters wide, and I, uh, or point, sorry, 0.52 millimeters wide, and I use a 0.51 millimeter wire. So essentially, it's a tiny bit. The wire is a tiny bit smaller than the actual drill bit is, and so you have a, it fits really snugly, but you still have a tiny bit of wiggle room, which is important. Uh, where is my file? Where are my files? My files are hiding out here in plain sight, of course. That, I never, actually knowing that I do this cookie, I never have that sharp of a blade. Not ever. I find it's, one, it's not necessary with miniatures. And two, I find a sharp blade is a liability for, for if I'm using it to clean the miniatures sometimes. Because I want to just lightly scrape. I don't want to gouge. So if I had been using a really sharp knife on this plastic card, I think I would have had actually a lot more problems. Um, because uh, it would have had a higher propensity to take more off with, um, with less pressure. Uh, so... I mean, yeah, if you've got a 3D printer, you can make a crystal and print it off. Where's the fun in that? <laughs> so I'm just going to use my big flat diamond file to flatten the top here of the center part until I have a nice flat area to drill into with my pin vise. That's coming down really well. A little bit more. There. I'm gonna polish it off really nicely.
They're a nice big surface. You can see that shiny spot. That's a nice big surface to pin that to. So let's see here. I think I'm going to want to, I can eyeball this, I think. Um, we haven't done pinning for a while. So for those of you who are new to the hobby, I'm going to talk to you um, about why, uh, how I do it. Uh, yeah, you could use actual crystals, but I don't find that, I mean, I would rather just put a crystal shape and paint it. All right, so take a hobby knife with a really sharp blade. Doesn't have to be a scalpel like this, can be a flat blade, as long as it has a good, good tip. And kind of find the middle of the area that you're looking to pin into with it. And this is just the first side that you're starting. So I'm starting with here, and I'll do the crystal after. And then kind of turn your knife, revolve it around. This makes a little divot. And that keeps your uh, drill bit from skittering to the side. So essentially you're making a tiny divot for your little tiny drill bit to go in here. Actually, my little tiny drill bit has glue on it. Oh no, or paint. It's got something on it. I need to use my knife to uh, clean it off just a tad. This is the problem for when I can't find my pokey tool and I'm like, grab my pin vise. <laughs> and then my pin vise, pin vise is like, eek. Now I do have extra extra drill bits, but this is again, me me abusing the materials today, guys. This is, you guys just get to see all my bad habits. We all have them from years of hobbying. All right, so now you fit your little drill bit into the little divot. Kind of eyeball it. Make sure that you are looking at it and it's going straight down into the surface. You don't want it to come out the side. This is a mistake that new people, including me when I was new, made. And you start to turn it, put a little bit of pressure on it with your palm. Just a little. When you've got a tiny drill bit like this, you don't want to put a lot of pressure on it. You can see already that it's kind of bending, right? So you can see how, how delicate it is. It's very easy to, to um, break the tips off of these in the hole. And that's like your, that's the doom. You don't want to ever do it. Especially not when you've got one chance at this, like this. Like if I dro broke the drill bit off in this model at this point, I would have nowhere else to go. Like I'd have to just putty on that crystal and hope that it's stuck, right? So it's very dependent. Yeah, I may need to go for a, I may need to go for a, a fresher drill bit. We'll see. It started okay. I'm just being very delicate because I know this staff likes to bend anyway because it's so thin. So I'll start putting a little bit more pressure on it. When you see metal threads start to come out, then you know you're going in the right direction. Ah, see, I went right through the side. There you go. But that's not an emergency because that's where, that's where you clean up. So see what happened. Here, let's get really close and I'll show you guys exactly what happened. This is the peril of getting really... So what happened is I went a little bit too close to the edge and it skidded out. And on a very shallow surface like this, it is liable to do that. You will run into that. So what I'm going to do is gently clean it up because this isn't a done deal. You can go back and try it again. I've got a little bit of essentially this lip of metal. Actually, I can almost lift it up with my knife, but this lip of metal gave way because I put a little bit too much pressure on it. So when you're doing delicate stuff like this, go very gently. It's much easier to do this with styrene than it is with metal. With metal, you've got to press more. And so you risk doing that when your metal wall is very thin. Mm, except that it tends to break off and not be sticking out in a farces. That's the problem, right? I know you're joking. So what that says to me is that my divot was either too far over, probably too far over. Now, what can I do to salvage this? Well, let's see. I'm actually going to widen out this divot a little bit in the opposite direction. This is the challenges that you go through. You figure out how to try to correct for it. And then, this is something you can do. You can come at it from an angle away from the part you blew out to just get a hole established you know what? This, since this is deciding it wants to screw up, I am going to switch to a fresh drill bit. Let me see if I can find my fresh drill bits real quick. Because I know they're around here, but if I can't find them, we're going to have to make do. I have all of these cubby holes, and uh, sometimes I forget where I put various, various things. And if I can't find it quick, then we're just going to go forward with what we've got. Yeah, I can't find it quick. I know what I'm looking for, but I do not know where I stuffed it. 
That shows you how often I change out my drill bit, which is not. <laughs> Thought I had them in here, but... Hmm. It's probably somewhere obvious, right under my nose. But we'll deal with it later. We'll just keep trying. And if we can't make this work, well, then we're just going to move on to the next part of the model. But ideally, I can make it work. So I can go in at a slight angle instead against the blowout. Hey, Drake, I don't, I don't do tubing. My, my techniques are extremely simple. Like it's what, it's what I do. It's what I've done. Um, right. But, uh, bug lips. I've never done that. This is the pin vice, the same pin vice I've been using for 20 years. I've never burst. I've never worn down the chucks. And I've always been using a 75. So I guess it's, it's depends on how you're using, how you're using it. But I find that I, that with these tiny 75s, the next size up doesn't hold it as securely. So maybe I'll bust it eventually, but be aware guys that that's a thing, um, that you can actually, cause I'm using the four points that come together on my vice. You can wear down those points, but I bet it depends on how much drilling you're doing. Cause I mean, I don't do a lot of conversion. Yeah, I don't know. I think I don't feel good about going forward with this if I can't find my excess drill bits. I would really want to start this with a very sharp new drill bit. So since I can't find it, guys, I think we're going to call this off. I'm going to take one more look around just to see. If there should be an obvious place it is, but I do not know. Is it in here? No. Yeah, dangest thing. Huh, I wonder where I stuffed it probably in one of my compartments over here and I just didn't look deep enough. Uh, I am extremely, extremely dubious about motorized pin vices. The reason is that with a hand pin vise, you can go slow. But Dremels have long had the problem where the pin vise goes too fast. Um, now, if it's a really slow one, maybe. Uh, I can try it out, Jalandar, but I'm betting that it's going to be not ideal with very small bits. A lot of people don't use a bit as small as I do, though. I use a tiny bit for everything. I don't use a large bit for anything. I never change this out. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Easier to connect the issue. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I would probably do, if I had broken off the bit in this one, I think I would, hmm, hmm, that's a hard question. I probably would just use the fact that I've got contact points with the side of the staff um, and use some green stuff to fill in and give it strength and do it that way to just, it wouldn't be nearly as tough though. So, okay, so you do it. See, around five, I know so many people have had bad experiences using motorized tools with pinning. But they probably were putting too much torque or too much speed. Um, so. Okay. I'm, like I said, I never, I remove it when I change it out. So your mileage may vary. Keep in mind what Buglip says. Especially if you were probably, it's due to switching things in and out more often than I do. I literally just push a drill bit until it's dull and then I switch it out. So, I mean, I probably switched out, you know, probably three dozen over the course of the last 20 years, but I guess it's still holding pretty well. Yeah. All right. If I can't, I'm kind of frustrated that I can't find my, uh, my flat thing that keeps my, my extra stuff in it for lack of a technical term. Usually I keep it right around me too. So, hmm, I must have eaten it. What you gonna do? Switching, switching strides, switching sides to quote over, lock, over uh, watch. So I'm gonna put away my pinning stuff, but at least we have a stabby thing. So now, um, so pro tip, when you make a stabby thing and you can't put it on right away, grab a tiny baggie from somewhere close to you and hopefully you have tiny baggies. They are super cheap, super cheap, tiny baggie. And this super cheap, tiny baggie gets labeled with what it is. 
that I put in it, and then stabby thing. Half work. And then the stabby thing goes in the baggie. Oh, you're brutal on your tools, bug lips. Yeah, that explains it. I'm really delicate with mine. I'm really, really gentle with them because I don't want to break anything because I break things too often. So, so yeah. So we now have stabby thing, half orc, and we have our tiny stabby thing in the bag, which means that it's a lot harder to lose. Like, I seldom lose stuff on my desk, but I do obviously do it. Oh, hey, I just realized there's another place where my stuff could be. Nope. Wrong place. No. Sad trombone. Now I'm really, really annoyed, though. Really, really annoyed. I've got all these tubs of stuff. And my tubs of stuff are organized, but apparently they are not organized enough. Aha! Oh, we might be saved. It was uh, hiding right in front of the front part, so I missed it. Do I have extra drill bits? Yes, I do. Woohoo! We're back in business. Boop. Tiny little thing full of drill bits. Yeah, they do, Penrate. Let's try this again with a fresh drill bit. There's like 10 of these per little thing. I ordered them from Micromark. Tiny little drill bit. Super. Who knows where the rest of my tiny little drill bits are, but at least I found one container of tiny drill bits. Much better. Even when they don't, I mean, you can always write on the plastic. It's just a little more durable if you have the other ones. So discard drill bit. Insert new drill bit. But yeah, always keep a bunch of tiny plastic bags around if you're working on 28 millimeter figures. It just helps to keep track of the extra bits if you don't glue them on right away. Or like with Games Workshop figures, I think it's necessary because they have alternate bits and things that you want to keep for maybe converting other figures. I'm going to very gently nudge this into place. There. That should work. Let's try this one more time. And if I still can't get it to work, then it's going to take some delicate finagling and I will have to switch and do something else. Yeah, it definitely wants to. Where's my knife? Where's my knife? I need to divot. Redivot. We will see what we can do. So I'm going to bore a little bit this way. And I don't want to bore up. Oh, didn't, didn't tighten it down enough. One second. Try, I also try not to tighten down my drill bit like excessively. I want it just tight enough so that it works. So essentially I'm using this to uh, create a fresh divot. A much deeper divot than I had before at a weird angle. Then I can start to move my pin vise back up to the angle I really want. Slowly. If I see little threads coming out of the hole, then I know I'm getting, I'm having some success. I need to make sure that my pin vise is more centered. I can see it through the gap that I broke open, so that's okay. Uh, nope, it is, a, it is not smaller. It's the same size, Varl. The other one had a little bit of, of residue on the outside of it. I have this habit of using it as a pokey tool. get my little threads out. So I'm getting threads, so I am drilling down, which is good. But I need to check and make sure that I'm not ripping it open as I go down. 
This is such a small area. The other thing that might be workable is if I do have enough room to seat a pin now, is I can put the pin in and green stuff over this front part and essentially just have the pin glued in two thirds of the way and then just green stuff over the front or the back in this case. So we, bro we broke it out on the perfect side because it's the rear of the figure. Um, and if I decide that this is too finagly and too difficult, like I don't want to mess with it, um, that would be the, the easy quick way to deal with it would be to just insert pin and go that way, go with that, go with that. But I don't know, I'm still a little bit annoyed and I still feel like I did have some slippage in the initial stages. Still a little bit annoyed with the, um, how far back it slid. So I'm going to carve out a little bit more, I think. And this is where having really good control is good. I'm carving out more of the top here. I want to make sure that my bit is seated toward the front a bit. Again, I can use green stuff to widen out the crystal, but I kind of like the crystal shape as is. I don't really want to widen out the crystal with green. Now, where's my wire? Wire. Come to me, wire. I have a big spool of it. You could also just get it in rods. I find it's very handy to buy the big spool because I can straighten it very easily. Where is my... Did David do this? I bet he did. <laughs> ah. It's like, wait a minute. I don't want a snarly tangle of wire. I want a fresh bit of wire. Like, it's, it's really not necessary to, <laughs> to twist that much up. I just leave the pokey bit sticking out and then, you know, I stab myself with it. It's far more efficient. Yeah, I can see that, Harumph. If you, if you like it. Have fun, Daffodweer. Well, that's what I did. I widened it out a bit. But I think I'm uh, leaning toward... Uh, I think I'm leaning, let me get rid of some of this extra plastic card debris, it's annoying me. Um, I think I'm leaning toward just like setting it in there and then green stuffing it to give it a more firm seat. Should be a little fragile, but I don't really care. Like more fragile than a straight pin. But we'll see what I can do. I'm gonna try it one more time. Yeah, it's like, you're okay, so all of this technique, guys, is, is just like, you know, try other things if you want to. It's the same as painting. Like Karam says, he feels strongly that, you know, a mechanical drill is better. I don't. Um, just, and it may just be my experience, you know. And I haven't used a very elegant, you know, newer drill. And they may have gotten very, very good. So... I mean, always try things if you can. I mean, don't go out and buy stuff and then discover that you hate it. Ideally, you try it with, when a friend has something that you can try out. Same with pin vices, because there are a bunch of different... There we go. Actually, that's nicer. I, I widened out the seat, and now I'm much happier with where that bit is going. And so now I feel like I can go down without busting out the side. And I kind of check it. You can check it from the side as well to see if you're in the middle of the area or if you're too far toward an end. But if I start this way, I think I'll be okay. I don't know. I broke a lot of drill bits back in my metals class too, so it seems to be a learning curve. But the bottom line is always... And, and after you drill for a bit, like wiggle it and pull back so you can get some of those threads out of the, uh, the hole, especially now that miniatures are made with, um, a lot of tin, which is a very hard metal, you'll, you'll see far fewer threads. If you ever like try to drill into a model that has more lead in it, like they did in the olden days, you'll find that, uh, that the threads come out a lot easier and, but it's harder to clear the hole when the metal has gotten harder. So I'll drill in a bit and then I'll pull out, drill in a bit, and then I'll reverse it, wiggle it, 
pull out threads. Now I'm going to grab a wire and I'm going to see where it is. Always test. Yeah, I know, Bryce. This is this is a, a workshop today on my bad habits as I'm having people tell me how they do everything differently, which is great. That's fine. More added value, right? Um, I don't like letting let him getting him too short though. I don't know. This is my comfort zone with the pill bit, with the drill bit. But I I put I have very light pressure on it. Probably cuz I did break so many drill bits when I was in metals class. So I learned how fragile they were, and now I'm, like, super delicate with them. Yeah, I hang out less, right? Uh, I want my Zappagap. Hello, Zappagap. You apply a tiny drop of Zappagap onto end of thing. And I mean tiny little dab. Remember, with super glue, less is more. The more, super, the more glue you put on a thing, the longer it will take to... Uh, to set. Let me see. Okay, it does go in there a bit. Yeah, we're good. And I'm going to cut extra than I need. Ah, well, that unseated it because I was silly. That's all right. Boop. So this is how you don't do it, and then you get better results than Anne. Yay! Ah. I'm going to have to do it with fingertips. And yes, this is what happens in real life, guys. Like, this is all the stuff you don't normally see. Is Anne futzing around and cussing a lot when she's working with her bits. There we go. I'm okay with that. So because it's so fragile and because it doesn't go in much beyond our wound there, um, I'm going to let it set for a bit while I mix up some paint. And we're going to actually let it sit for probably the rest of the stream. I don't think I'm going to get the crystal on today. I have needle nose pliers. I'm just frustrated and think fingertips are better, Pendrake. Oh, did you see my little spear thing that I made for her, Bryce? I wanted a crystal here, so I got out plastic card because Bob Rodolfi is inspiring. And I made a stabby thing because it was really long and it looked like a spear blade. And then we, we decided that, or I decided that that made perfect sense for a half-orc wizard, that her crystal staff would also be a weapon. So we made we made a little crystal spearhead. Like a really rough chiseled one. So very, very orky. So we're going to put that, and it fits really well, like on top of the staff between the horns. So I like it a lot. So yes, we're going to do that. Oh, I have fantastic needle nose players. I have surgical surgical pliers. So they are super needle nose. Like they're lovely. I adore them. But in a pinch, I forget to grab them. <laughs> Guys, I really am of the school that like the simpler and the more I can do with just hands, the better. Like I am not the person to use a tool if I can work with my hands. Like not at all. I trust my fingers more than a pliers. I trust my dexterity with my fingers more than with the pliers. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, again, if you're very good with tools, which I am not, then absolutely reach for the tool. Reach for the tool that works best. But the tool that works best is going to be different for different people. Every orc needs a stabby thing. It's true. Uh, all right. So cool. So we're letting that set and I feel like it's pretty good right now. So I'm going to let it sit there and let's figure out our red. I'm trying to see. She does have a little bit of a, a bodice. And then she's got a bunch of belts. But this area is very muddy. It's hard to make out what's going on there. Like, there's a piece there that I'm not sure about. I wonder, do we have a painted version of her up on the web, guys? Let me see. Because that's your... Uh, that's your good thing, if we can say... Uh, let's see here. All right. We've got the bones version, actually. Let's see if we can make it out. 
Ah, okay. Now I can see it. So often, and this is ironic because a face isn't nearly as good, but we can make out what things are now. This is a belt that goes around. We've got a buckle here and a belt pouch. And here we've got another buckle that's uh, probably attached to coming down from this. And then we've got a belt pouch. We've got probably, I think this is another belt that goes around to hold that better. I, it could also just be part of her, her um, bodice. But then there's the bottom of the bodice. So if you have questions about what detail on a model is, even with metal, even with resin, anything like that, um, then, you know, go and look at maybe the original green if you can find a picture of it or, you know, look at a different, uh, you know, a print or another primed version. You might be able to see what the details are a lot better. Yeah, exactly, Bug Lips. Yeah, I, I hit that point a lot where I just quit and use my fingers. I'm just going to take a quick snapshot of this model picture, and uh, that way I'll have it on my phone easily accessible. I don't think I'm seeing... Oh, there is a, a painted version by somebody. So yeah, looks like belts, belts, more belts. It's a talon thing. Okay, and that... That's bodice. All right. I think that I can work with that. Excellent. So yeah, look at other people's painted versions. Look at um, the, uh, you know, an unpainted version that isn't yours. If you find that you have a problem figuring out what stuff is, that can help an awful lot. Because before looking at this, I'm just like, arg, what is it? But now I, I, I get it. And part of that Yes, exactly. You can use the Discord to ask your fellow adventurers if they've painted the model and if they uh, know what something is. So, yeah. Alrighty. She does look pretty okay. Let's get this, uh, let's get this stuff going then. Alright, we said we were going to use a warm red on this one. I'm going to start really dark. Really, really dark. Um, we're going to use Desmodeus, but we're going to mix it with black and brown to get close to a color I used to use for this. There was an old uh, Vallejo color, probably still out there, I just don't own much Vallejo anymore, um, that uh, is a dark red. That's a, It's a dark brown red. It's really, really... Really quite dark, and when you paint it on originally, it, it has a lot of red in it, but it looks brown. Burnt cadmium red, I think. Don't remember. It was an actual cadmium, I guess, originally. I don't know if they're still putting actual cadmium or if it's a uh, hue now with Vallejo. Um, do, 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 do. I don't think I have it. No. I don't have any Vallejos in my, my immediate vicinity. I still have a couple. Colors that I really like. If I need a reminder on what the color looks like and maybe I want to mix uh, something that's close. Because I didn't get around to it when I was making Master Series. Alright, I'm going to add one drop of water to this. I'm two drops of the uh, Asmodeus and one drop of, or two drops of the black and brown. I may need to add more Asmodeus if I feel like I need a little bit more red. I am going to get my pinning wire out of the way. Putting learning to put away tools right after I've used them is like it's hard, but it has worked so well in my kitchen strategy that I uh, I have to adapt it to my hobby strategy. Because I was one of those people who always would end up with a desk littered of everything that I just used, and in in the kitchen with cooking, I'm very good. I clean as I go, and I even like clean and then you know dry it off and put it away. So like David actually cleans up after dinner when I cook, but most of the time it's very easy for him because I've gotten in such this habit of like clean as I go. So with my hobby desk, I'm trying to get in the habit of doing the same thing where I, I clean up and reset. Um, as I finish using a tool, I put it away, you know, things like that. I think it's just like good strategy for me because I can easily get overwhelmed if I have too much clutter on my desk. All right, so I've doubled the amount of Asmodeus, but Blackened is so very strong that it's still a very, very, very dark brown. So I'm going to go whole hog. I'm going to actually go 
eight drops of Esmodius to two drops of the black and then see what that does. Because Esmodius, uh, the base is, is a very strong red, but it's just that the black base in the, um, the amount of black pigment... Oh, there we go. High density black pigment is uh, very, very strong in black and brown. So we're going to start almost black with this red. If you want it to look like a black velvet, then you got to start really, really, really dark. And I don't know if I'm going to go straight for velvet, but I like the drama of having the very dark and working it up. So I'm going to switch over to the um, Raphael today. I've been using all of our different brands of brushes lately. Yeah, especially if you're like Minifarsis and you do get overwhelmed and feel kind of like buried if you get too much stuff in front of you. I have learned that that is a thing for me. And so now this is a very dark red brown. And it was four to one Asmodeus to black and brown. Now it's going to cover up all my Zenith, but that's fine. I, I mean, I know where my highlights go at this point. You can see it. And actually, I want to point out something because somebody just asked me the other day about cloth and highlighting it. You can very much see that most of the light is on her outstretched arms and chest and shoulders. And then you just get the little fold showing up a little bit more across her midriff. And then this fold, which is bunching out from underneath her uh, belt, that, that causes it to come out a bit. It could also be that her knee here is a little bit forward under the sculpt. It's, of course, hard to say, but you could. And then you see where the, the dress flares out at the bottom. You're catching more light as well. But there's a big shadow area in here, even on these folds, that you can take into account by not highlighting it. You could put a highlight on it, but don't put all the highlights on it. Um, so if you're trying to do more realistic lighting, that's the difference, right? If you were just trying to highlight and shade the figure kind of in the traditional American way, you would have all of these folds highlighted probably to the same level. They would just be brighter toward the bottom. But really, you could go bright, darker, and brighter, and it might look a little bit more real. So again, primer is not the same as light. And so you have to use your discretion as well, but it's a thing. So and then back here, this is actually correct. So where the primer has hit here, you can see it's outlined the folds. It's showed you where your shadows need to be. And these are correct. Um, but, and down here though, you know, we would normally leave dark inside these folds, right? But look at the primer. The primer is filling in that because these are coming out to the side. If the light is coming down like this, there's not going to be shadows here. There might be a tiny bit of shadow. You can, uh, let's see. Yeah, if I turn it toward my light source, you can see a shadow up here, but it fades out as it goes down. And this is not actually a shadow. This is just the primer um, you know, the angle primer, not quite getting as much, but we could use this and essentially just go with a much, just more of a mid tone here. And then a highlight in the middle, a highlight in the middle of the fold, because that's what would happen. So you can use, this is where Zenith can be useful to break your preconceptions and go, no, not every center of every fold is dark. If the light is falling in there, then the sides of that fold will be slightly darker, but where it spreads out at the bottom, the light's going to hit. So this is where Zenith lighting can help you if you really are, have no idea, right? I, I liked the cadmium, um, the burnt cadmium red because uh, it was just like, in my mind, it was the perfect cover, color viral. You can use any dark red, right? But if you want to do something that's more like velvet, where your shadows are almost black, you have to start, just start very, very dark. And I find that I have, with this type of technique, I have more luck building up from dark to light um, as well, which is not my usual MO nowadays. And usually now I start with my mid and then I go down and then I go up and I tune it. But I used to paint everything dark to light. And with red, with this sort of red, I still like it. Now, one thing I do need to ask myself, guys, is, is her cape going to be the same color? It is now time to think about, like, what we're actually doing here. Because the upper part of her dress is going to be this color, but we can see that the cape technically can be a different color. Like, her sleeves and her dress and her, her skirts are all going to be red. But now we have an opportunity to put another color on this cape. So I'm going to not paint it red for now, and we shall assess as we go. 
once again doing the Anne Anne thing of not planning out the entire model, but just taking uh, step by step with the colors that I know I want until I come to a question mark and then I have to make the decision. It's kind of like exploratory painting. It's like, I don't want to know how the story ends when I start. I know roughly. Some models, I guess, I have to take that back. Some models I have a very strong concept for out the gate. But even those models, I am open to them finding their own way if I come up with a better idea. Or one that I want to explore. Oops, sorry, off camera. Dark red. But yeah, when I'm doing a really dark red that I intend to take up to yellow and white, because we'll go all the way up to white on this sucker probably, just for fun. I want to do like, like I did my old days, which is not velvet, by the way. If you want uh, crushed velvet or velvet in general, it does not go above a brilliant um, bright red. It doesn't go up to white because it's not as shiny. It's the opposite of a shiny fabric. Once again, you have to think about surfaces. But if I decide that I want more of a satin a dark red satin, then I still have very dark shadows in a dark red and I might bring it up higher. Mostly this is my opportunity to do old school red like I used to do. Lots of different layers and a really vibrant punch. Takes a while, but it's pretty. Alrighty, got to keep on camera. We'll make a note, Val. Four drops of uh, Asmodeus Red from Pathfinder and one drop of Black and Brown, 9137. All right, I've got a bag off her side here, but there's, and there's a belt going up there, but yeah, I can see it a little bit, but part of her dress is off her hip here. And I am probably going to make this bodice a different color, but I haven't decided yet. So for now it's red. Um, it will likely be the color that her cape gets. Because again, repeating colors on the model. But yeah, this is this is close to the color I used to start with. It's really, 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 really dark red with brown in it. I could go even darker, obviously. It's still not um, really black. If I used an additional color to shade this, you could either go dark brown or you could go with a dark purple. Purple sometimes works very well to shade red, because, especially if you're, you're highlighting up to yellow because those are complementaries and it makes the whole dress look like really, really red at the end if you get your... Um, if you're using like a clear red as your mid-tone or a, something close to it. You can get some very vibrant reds that way. Kind of thinking about dark blue for her cape. Don't know. That would give her, but right now we've got a complementary color scheme, right? We've got, uh, we've got red and green. Very, very straightforward. Except it's not straightforward only because the green is an olive and the red is a, is a dark red brown. But it's still complimentary. You're still doing green and red. So if you ever wondered how to do green and red without doing Christmas, this is how you do it. You go with a non-Christmas green and a non-Christmas red. Val, I'm going to make a request. 
Don't order me to stretch. It does the exact same. Don't tell me when to stretch, please. I am a recalcitrant Anne, and uh, this is why I never work with personal trainers at the gym. I don't care if it's good for me or it's the right way to do it. If you tell me to do it, I'm going to look at you and go, no. <laughs> so please do not inform me when to stretch. Asking if it's stretch time is great. Just giving you a little heads up on and, and idiosyncrasies. Like, seriously, this is why I never work with a personal trainer. This is why. <laughs> this is why, uh, you know, I, I lasted pretty long at Reaper, but I didn't last long in corporate America. <laughs> but I can decide whether I want to do stretch time after this color or not. So please just remind me. Do not, uh, do not inform me, shall we say. Because seriously, I will, I will like totally not stretch. I will totally go, no, I'm going to do another color. Let's see here. Did I miss anything? We've got a belt coming in. We do have another belt here. I think these are all belts. So I think we're good. I think we're good on that. Let's mix up our next color. Then I will stretch. Yes, Anne has problems with authority. Except I don't. It's really weird. I'm a very obedient Anne in most cases. All right, let me see here. Let's see. Okay, so in the olden days, I would have picked a totally, kind of like a total spectrum of reds. Like I used to have a total spectrum of reds that I would go up with. Um, in this case, I may mix... Since I started with Asmodeus and it doesn't have a triad, I probably should go up with it first. It's also very close to this color. Let's see. Especially after I thin it. I may need to put a tiny bit of the black and brown in it. But you know what? So I'm going to go six drops of this. But then I'm not actually going to use the black and brown since I know how strong it is. I'm going to actually just take a little brush full of this and put it in here to make the two have even more in common. I'm going to build that up. So that's our transition. So now if I take a grayscale, let's see. These are very close. Oh, okay. Right, bug lips. I resist that. I resist that so hard, like trying to, I, I, I guess I have a tiny bit of goblin in me. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to, to find out I was, I was orcish, you know, in some ways, because I, I do like them. And uh, sometimes it, it's just be like that. You're just like, you do not tell me to do anything. You can, you know, suggest, hey, we might want to blah soon. But yeah, no, it's, it's bad, man. I totally feel it. All right, so actually, when I get my grayscale in here, guys, very interestingly, um, it's probably a nine. It's somewhere, it's like a nine and a half. Like, I can see that the nine is too light for our original color, but it's a little bit lighter than black. So it is really a near black red at this point. Um, yep, just a note for the future, Val. Um, but then when we come up to this next one, it's also pretty darn dark. Like, this is where we run into... Okay, it's too dark there. It's good there. Yeah, so this is only going up by, like, half a step, guys. It's like a 9.5 to a 9. So it may not be quite enough. We'll see. We'll see. But this is much more red. So we're not changing our light versus dark ratio very much, but we're changing our color, right, from more of a brown. Oh, Cheap Joe's. Ah, did you get a palette? Did you get a palette? Yes, I will. Now that I've got this mixed up, what I'm going to do is add a drop of water so it doesn't thicken up on me, and then we'll stretch. Ed used to joke that all his department heads were alphas and that that made problems, but it also made solutions. <laughs> uh, 
Alrighty, so let's see here. Yeah, that's about right. So nine and a half to ten, nine-ish. Which, when you consider that my old way of doing red was really a nine layer red, this should not surprise you. Like, cause it, it means I'm using a lot of transitions. It might be dangerous to go for three. <laughs> you learned never to tell and to do something. And what else did you learn, Bryce? <laughs> I am. I, there are days when I'm just darn ornery. I don't know how David puts up with it. All right. If you've been sitting for as long as me or longer, get your butts up and do some stretch. Oof. Oh, that's much nicer. We learned not to tell Anne to stretch after this color. It is always good to suggest to Anne, or to ask Anne, hey, is it stretch time or did we miss stretch time? It's much better to do it that way. <laughs> Bug lips, I'm, I'm, I'm a little scared to find out that you and I have like more in common than I might have thought. <laughs> I try very hard to never be cranky, but yeah, I do get irritated at people sometimes. Well, I, I think this comes partially from being a very accommodating person in my early days, like in my childhood days, I was very, very accommodating and I always put myself last. So when I started to like kind of bounce back against that, um, it was, it was epic. <laughs> Yeah, don't tell me what to do. Never tell me what to do. Suggest. Suggest. Uh, uh, science guys are not as good with the social stuff. Well, the thing is, though, Bryce, and this is why David is perfect, is David never tells me what to do. Like, he's not that type of guy. This is why it's brilliant. This is why I adore him. I'm not letting go of this one. No way. He's he's mine. Because he, ne he just doesn't. Like, David would never tell anybody to do anything he would say hey did you mean to do blah or hey did you decide not to do blah today or are we going to do blah today that's what david does like that's his phrasing because he would never tell me to do anything you know like he gives me cred i love it or don't forget to do blah you know don't forget to do blah is also is always is also good it's not technically in order it's more like a reminder to my brain. I'm going to do my cat cows. And it could be, oh, I need to do one more stretch. go much better Alrighty, we are up 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 but yeah mostly i think i was just trying to please everybody when i was younger and then when i got older i was just like kind of ornery about it i was just like dang it i'm gonna do what i want and i'm not always gonna let people tell me what to do and when yes yes carrie exact that's exactly how he'd phrase it too are you really going to leave the eyes blank until you finish the rest of the mini? He's like, arg the eyes. That's where he'll go. Arg the eyes. But he knows he's, he's not going to, like, David just would never say, paint the eyes. You know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't put it that way. He gives me cred for being an adult and he doesn't tell me to do things. It's, uh, it's good. Alrighty, let's see. Now, when you're working with colors that are so similar here, you can leave them much thicker. I talk about this, but I don't often do it. So, uh, let's rock it. So, when you've got colors that are close together, guys, you don't have to thin as much for your layering. And I've mentioned this before, but I haven't actually done it. 
so we'll do it. I'm gonna use a traditional layering brush stroke though. I always go sideways on long surfaces. And these colors are so close together. You're not gonna see much of a difference. This is a technique that builds up over time and layers. And you aren't gonna really, it's gonna be very hard to see. I'm just gonna start doing this. And I'm gonna actually bring shadow, I think, back in just to make sure I, I'm doing it correctly. I am gonna do my first highlight down all of the folds, however, and you'll see it's very, you can see it's very close. <laughs> Reapercon ribbon time. Time to stretch. Yeah, that would be a great ribbon. Did they put out the um did they put out the link to where to order ribbons from? Or do people just find their own places? Or remember to stretch. Or a stretch time ribbon. Yeah, something like that. That would be fun. That'd be cool. Cause you know at the con, we're all terrible about it. Because we're always getting interrupted and we're always trying to juggle a bunch of things in our brains. And uh, getting totally distracted by stuff. Or other people's new shiny models, for example. So when it gets really narrow, like at the top of this fold, then it's okay to use an up and down stroke. But in general, on... On long areas, go sideways when you do your highlights because it, the brush stroke, if you leave a brush stroke at all, it's just going to confuse the eye and make it look like a better blend. Whereas if you do vertical strokes, and a lot of beginning painters make this mistake, if you do vertical strokes to highlight, the eye is going to pick that up right away because the fold is long and narrow and your brush stroke is long and narrow. So it's just going to see the lines. Yes, yes, Carrie Michael. It is pretty awesome, actually, isn't it? Yeah, they are sort of expensive. I think I, I asked Adrian which one Reaper was using, and then I just ordered from there, and they were expensive. But Stretch Time is a really good Anne ribbon, so... I did my Drown Nipple one myself. But now that that's a that is a reaper thing, not an and thing anymore, so yeah, I would probably do a stretch time. That way you can take off the ribbon and leave it in front of you to remind you. <laughs> I should make it really loud. Yeah, it usually it's people using slightly different sizes, whatever the default size is, right, Pendrake? Yeah, I don't I don't mind it so much. I, I can usually start a new row or something or trim the ribbon. Yeah, the Drownable Pink, yep. I believe the last ribbon was Ask Me About Drown Nipples, which was awesome. And honestly, the great thing about the Drown Nipple Pink thing and the ribbons was that it made me laugh all through the con. Like that's, that's the best. When you could just pass the ribbon and you just, it makes you want to laugh. So see how these are very different. These are different colors, but, and and I'm putting this on very thick. If I wasn't putting it on very thick, it actually would take a couple layers to even build up because these colors are so close. But that's giving us a very rich dark red, isn't it? Which I love. Um, and you can maybe see how this almost, the black and brown almost gives this purplish cast to the shadow now. So if we wanted to take a nightshade purple or a really, really dark purple and paint it in there as an even darker shadow, we could. Um, yay, well palette. Awesome, Pendrake. Awesome. So I did want to tell people today that on my own stream later, um, I'm probably going to be working on the Sky Earth NMM model. Um, I've got my PDF almost all written and there are just some pictures that I need. And so I need to set up some new areas on the figure. Um, so I thought I might uh, put off the D&D game for a week and do the Sky Earth Templar instead. Because um, I really, I like to work on it in front of you guys because it is, you know, the PDF is static, but the 
But uh, working on it in front of you guys lets me explain stuff. So she still, her head is not attached still. Because I, I really need to deal with the back here before I uh, before I attach it. So she's still going to be wobbly headed for a while. But I want to uh, deal with uh, the other uh, breastplate. And I want to um, deal with uh, maybe the some of the neck piece or the wings here or one of the part of the arm. So I am thinking that I want to work on this today. On my own stream. That would be twitch.tv slash painting big. Um, if it's a big one, it doesn't come with a lid, in my opinion, Pendrake. I think that only the small ones come with a lid. Or you can get the combined thing of palette with lid. I don't I don't think maybe there is one for this big palette, but I, I didn't see one when I ordered it originally. Don't worry, just grab some cling wrap. Or your wet palette sponge and put it, you know, dampen it and put it over the top. Though the sponge can get paint on it that way, so I don't find that as useful. So, But you could always get a cheapo car sponge or something and do it. I, I just use cling wrap. I have various pieces of cling wrap off in my bookshelf here to use for it. And uh, if you are going to use cling wrap to use to preserve your paint, it'll it'll keep for a day or two. Um, it's better if, like, if I was going to preserve this, I would take my water dropper bottle and I would put a drop of water in each of the wells around it. Um, and that would help because it would keep moisture uh, in that area on the palette. And it works great if you, I mean, even if you have these, like, two rows all filled, then you can put a drop of water in all the next row. Um and even if you forget and start to mix paint in that next row, it just means you've got one drop of water in there. So it's really not a deal breaker. Even if you're like, oops, my paint is pre-thinning. But a little extra regular fluid um, helps to keep the paint good. And I've left it for up to three days. If I, you also don't, if you've got paint that's thickening on this, you do want to add that extra drop of water before you put your cling wrap on just to give it a little extra longevity. And if, if I do that, I've been able to keep it like two to three days without opening it before I got back to it and then just mix it up and it was fine. Yeah, no problem. Splat, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I love this. I love the Templar and the the Sky Earth and MPDF actually made me lose a little bit of enthusiasm for her at first because you know then it then it goes from fun to a job. But I'm almost done with the PDF now, and I really like how she's turning out. I like how I'm how how the NMM is coming out. It makes me happy. Um, I was thinking about I kept myself awake last night thinking about what I wanted to do for freehand, <laughs> so I know my enthusiasm for the model is back. Sometimes you will lose enthusiasm for a project, guys, but don't give up on it right away. Because if it is something that you've been excited about painting for a while, it could be just that you're kind of stuck. And you need to give, or give it a little time to figure out where you're going with it. And that's where I think the shelf of, of shame, or the shelf of lost love, as we call it in this house, um, is a useful thing. Because it, it lets you still look at it. Like, if I hadn't kept her out where I could see her every day, it would have been easy to just forget about her. But because I, I didn't quit because I hated her, but more that I was just kind of tired and out of ideas. Um, you know, so then when I started looking at her again, and I was reminded that I really like her and she's going well, um, then I was able to come back uh, with the enthusiasm I originally had for the project. And the fact that the PDF's almost over now means that I can, uh, you know, go back to just painting her for fun. <laughs> uh, it really does make a difference. Like, there is a reason why people tell you, you know, not everybody can turn their hobby into a job. And sometimes you hate to do it, is that it will, it will affect the way that you feel about your projects. So it's always recommended. That's why I was making fun of Flickster yesterday. A little bit because it's like he's like this I'm just painting this for me I'm like wait painters can do that because sometimes when you're a professional and you do it for a living you forget that like that's that's the danger of painting for a living is that uh, especially if you've got a work ethic which sadly I I do my my father instilled his 1950s work ethic into me uh 19 uh and so he um 
you know, I grew up with that kind of, you know, I've got a job to do and I need to do it kind of mentality. Uh, but that means it's hard to relax sometimes and just let myself paint something for fun. So it is a challenge. It is a thing. I ha I'm handling it very much better this iteration than 20 years ago when I first tried to go freelance. But there's also better tools now. So... And then having, uh, having a significant other who, like, is, wants to do stuff together and, uh, you know, reminds me that I need to take time off from working on Patreon stuff or whatever um, is good. Alrighty. So that's, that's lovely. I like this dark red. So, again, a, a basic problem that beginning a beginning painter might stop here because they like it. <laughs> but remember to always put at least two more highlights. Uh, Orc Wizard, yes. Uh, here, here, um, Road Dog. Road Dog. This one. We're working on her red dress and we also put a pin in her staff so that I could pin a crystal to it later. Probably do that after the stream. It should be set. It should be actually set now, but I want to green stuff that wire. Make sure that's got enough strength. And also reposition it just a little bit. So yes, so we're working on our reds right now. We're gonna work up to here. Remember that the only thing that was really highlighted on her stomach was these little folds here. Yeah, she's a half orc, Pendrake. I decided to paint her, because she's got the tusks, though, and everything, I decided to paint her with more of an orky skin tone. But remember, I did I did mute out the skin tone more than I would normally. I would much use, you'd normally use a stronger olive for a true orc. Reaper, uh, I mean, she's very petite to be a full orc. She's actually billed as a half orc. So a couple of folds here, highlighted. Gonna get the hip out here. There's a fold kind of bunching up there. And again, I may paint that if there is a bodice. It's a, it's a question whether this is just one long dress or if she has a little bodice on. And what we'll do is we'll probably paint everything else and decide if we need this, uh, if we need a bodice in a contrasting color to make all everything stand out. So thank you, Quindy. Quindy with the links. She's so good. This is a really cool model, though. Honestly, guys, you should pick it up. She's a nice change of pace. Like, you don't see a lot of half-orc wizards. So we got that highlight on top of the chest because that's where light will fall. And we're going to bring that up a lot more through the course of painting. But yeah, the nice thing about working with colors that are very close together, especially if you're newer, is that you can keep your paint thicker. I'm probably working four to one. I'm working base coat consistency with this paint. Um, and you can still like, it, it still blends just fine. Like it looks like it's blended because they're so the colors are so close together. So if you're just starting out, and as you're learning paint consistency, you can use this trick. And you'll have to do more layers, but it won't, um, you won't have to struggle with thin paint as much in the beginning. You will want to start thinning gradually more and more, just so that you can get a feel for paint consistency for various other techniques. But when you're starting out, if you're starting out layering, you can just do more transitions with thicker paint and it will look more blended a lot of people make the mistake of like punching their highlights up but then they don't thin enough like they punch their highlights up really fast they go up really fast in their transitions and but they don't thin and so then they get this horrible chalky highlight That's a pretty red. Yeah, Shadow Raven, enjoy your lunch. Thank you for coming. All right. Oh, and I did get a little, there is a little bit of dress back here. 
This red is dark enough that I feel like I can use it in the shadow just to pick up the color a little bit to show that she has like a bit of dress showing back here. Um, on the very, very underside of the arm, I will not put this red, just like I'm not putting it in some of these folds. However, remember where we said back here where there was light in this fold? We're going to do that now. Because we used our zenith, and we actually want to get this fold too, because the light would be shining down right on top of it. So we might get a bit of a shadow on some of the sides here where they turn kind of perpendicular to the light, but we will have a strip of light down the middle here. It will be dark up here though, remember, because the wrap is, is overshadowing this part of the dress. So. Uh, you're going to run into, at that point, Pendrake, what you might run into is, um, lack of contrast. Uh, sure, I could start with a bright red, but not only would I not think that was a great color scheme, but, um, it's just because it's too close. Like, some people, if you're doing an analogous color scheme, then yes, you absolutely would do stuff like that. You would use a very dark version of the color, and then you might use a slightly light version of the color, like a medium to light version, like almost a pink, um, to, uh, you know, to get contrast if you were limited. But I don't like, um, like, palettes that are too close together. I don't like choosing colors that are lighter and darker versions of the same color, unless I've got a very strong theme like I can see doing like on Xandros where I'm I'm using a medium blue and I'm using a dark blue and then a medium blue along with the aqua. Um, so on Xandros, I don't mind the fact that I used dark blue and then I've also got some stuff that's painted medium blue. I guess it bothers me a little less with blues. And then I've got this stuff that's like tealy green. So we were very analogous on Xandros's color scheme until we came into the, uh, the bronze, um, we are very, very all in one all in one area, right? We did technically bring up the green toward yellow, so it it's not as close as it might be, but um, but with him, even with him, I'm not doing the cloth in that lighter version of the same blue, right? I'm doing little accents with it, like the book and the the hand the handles here. But when it comes to to the cloth, I'm going for higher contrast. I'm going with the greenish tealish color instead of the medium blue for the cloth because I want more contrast. Um, and this is also very saturated. I, I'm taking it up with yellow instead of with white alone. So it stays saturated here. Here, if I went up to a red, I mean, I could make it like a faded rose, but but then what am I going to do when I'm bringing up the highlights here? I'm planning to make these, high, these highlights very vibrant, very saturated. Like, so... If I went with faded up here, not only would it not make sense of the story for me, um, because she's got this very rich dress on, but uh, it would it would just probably clash a bit. If you make only if we did faded on her, we'd have to do everything that way, because then then you're really like, I don't feel like it makes sense to make one thing faded and one thing not. Um, like, if, if the cloak is sun-faded, some parts of the dress would probably be faded, too. But mostly, Pendrake, I just don't like to wear... If I can use a different color, I like to use a different color so that I can... Even if that color is a neutral, so that I can get more contrast. Um, and, I mean, I think about how, how vibrant I want this red to come up, and then I think about fading it out like pinky-brown, and I go, ooh, that's not going to work together. But, I mean, if you're going to go faded and dirty, then, you know, you can always start that way and then start introducing your dirt and doing glazes of dirty color like I'm doing on Ms. Halfling here, right? Where I'm starting to introduce more patches of dirt. I'm starting to introduce some dirt underneath here and underneath the belts. And I'm going to dirty up her feet. And I'm going to probably add even more smudges and stuff like that. I want her to look like she's been out in the wilderness or the dungeon for a long time. She's all cut up and nicked up. Um, and she's very out of temper with it. <laughs> so, like, if you're going to go, 
Like I could, if I was going to fade the pink at this point, I would put a, a glaze of the brown over it and then work it up from there. I'd still have started out with this, I guess. I could do that with this model. I could bring her up to a vibrant red and then I could start fading out parts of her. Um, that's the better way to do it, I think. But it's not really my concept for her. Um, I, I suspect that she, she's a half-orc who has fought for her position. Like, how many half-orc wizards do you know of? She has fancy clothing on. For, for an orc, this is excessively fancy. Um, you know, it's very high quality. She's got, you know, lots of details here and tooling. Um, you know, and she's, you know, got a fancy uh, orky hairstyle and uh, she probably wants to keep her stuff in pretty good repair because, you know, if she let it get all faded and dirty, I mean, you could, you could make her personality otherwise, but I wanted her to be kind of, kind of a very cultured orc. So all those things, all those things. But if you're going to go faded on one thing, go faded on everything, even if it's just a little, even if we only did fading around her hem, we'd have to do it on everything. And if I was going to do it, I'd probably make the cloak a different color even then. But I like, um, I, I'm thinking about dark blue for the cloak because it was one of my favorite. I used to have this favorite color scheme that really, it was this dark red with a olive green and a blue gray. Um, you could certainly put a fur texture on here. You'd be going with, um you know, a different color then. You'd be going with a neutral, but with texture. You could do it. It's not, uh, even though fur texture isn't, um, isn't sculpted on here, you could still do it and do a pattern, but because it's, because it's a very simple cloth, right? No problem, AKT. Here it is. Bonsalay Half-Orc Wizard, 3721. Yeah, gray blue was, this was my favorite color scheme back in the day of eBay. Like, I loved doing the dark red, olive green, and gray blue crows. So you and I are on the same wavelength there. Um, what color, how light I take it, or whether I keep it medium, or whether I take it black, black and come up with blue gray is, is the question. And, and it'll depend on how this dress comes up. So now we're going to go straight up to Asmodeus, I think. Where are you, Asmodeus? Did I put you back? I can't put it back. Nope. I didn't take, didn't put it back. I ate it. Apparently, there it is. Yeah, she's a really nice model, AKT. I don't know if I would make this rep, um, Ermine. Though, like, it there's no. I'd want to do some sculpting if I was going to do it, Pendrake, because there is with a fur. You'd probably at least see a suggestion of that in the edge of the wrap. So if I was going to do this as a pelt or a fur, fur cape, I think I would want to go in and at least nick up the edge and maybe do a little bit of sculpting that suggests a little bit of furry texture at the ends because that's going to be necessary to convey that. Um, uh, it's just not, I don't know, it's not what I had in, envisioned for her, so... It also doesn't have any of the, like, you'd normally, I think, get a little coarser folds. But, I mean, you could do it. You could do it. But if you want to see me do freehand on this like I wanted to, then you, um, you know, don't want to see me do fur. I mean, it'll be freehand. It'll just be the same. It'll, it'll just be not, not the freehand I originally envisioned. I haven't come up with a uh, specific, but kind of want to do some panels on the lower part of her dress and then something on the back of the cape. So straight up to Asmodeus, and this again is going to be about a four to one, so it's a base coat level. Maybe it's a little bit thicker, a little bit thinner. I may have gone accidentally three to one, but... When you're going so close, going thin, when you're going so close in color, going thin is a bad idea. Because you want the color to show up. And when you thin a color, it goes transparent. And that transparency then works against you getting a strong color. Now I have to start thinking about light. So 
I'm probably going to want a bit more light, but I also have to think about color. So, all right. So two things to think about here. I have to ask myself, what color is the dress actually? What am I going to cover most of the area with? Is it going to be this red? Is Do I want the dress to be Asmodeus red? Like, is that the actual color of the dress? And if it is, then I will go up and down every fold and inside the folds um, with this color. Because I need this color to stay at least 50% of every fold for it to look this color. If I decided that actually the color is this really dark red here, the Asmodeus black and brown mix, then I would start limiting my highlights now to be in the areas where the light is falling. And I would start thinking more about that. But I think I'm more in favor of it being a slightly more vibrant red. So I think Asmodeus is a good mid-tone to aim for. So I am going to put Asmodeus down every fold then. Gonna go and just kind of reaffirm here. I'm just gonna go over the same area I did before with this little bit of red. This is uh, this is old school and red, so I do things a little differently now, but I still enjoy doing this every once in a while. You see how that Asmodeus is really perking up the highlights. We are leaving a little bit of our previous color showing underneath. If our previous color um, gets buried, I can always bring a little bit more of it back in using the same brush stroke, the same sideways brush stroke to make sure the edges blend in. So you can by all means go back and back and forth. No, it wouldn't be Astro. I would the Asmodeus would not be my final highlight. Um, I would I still go up to two to three more layers. But the, the, what becomes different then is where I put my highlights. Like, so because Asmodeus, I want it to be the whole thing, I'm putting the highlight all the way down these folds. But if I had decided to keep the previous red, I would start focusing on the upper and lower parts of the folds, just like we saw at the beginning of the video. where we're And you can see it now. You can see the light falling on the chest, on these little folds here, on this fold here where it sticks out, and then on the bottom. So... Essentially, I would still go up the same level, the same number of layers, but I would shrink my highlights faster if I was staying darker red. Never, never think that doing darker red means you don't have to highlight. You still have to bring it up. Um, and it depends also, though, on how dull your cloth is, right? If you don't, if you don't highlight much, then it's going to look like a very dull cloth. Um, and if, but if all the other stuff on your model suddenly has these lighter highlights, people are going to question that the dress is unfinished. Like, why didn't you take that up? A lot of people are scared to bring the reds up higher on a dark red. They think it's going to make it not a dark red. This isn't true at all, but you have to make sure your highlights go smaller. Um, oh, you better buy Asmodeus. It's one of the best reds we've done, Big Apple. It's so nice. It's beautiful and warm. It's a nice warm dark red, which we didn't previously really have. Although um, Carnage, Carnage and its friends were close, are close. But yeah, so let's fill in this a little bit more. When it comes to the bottom, I don't mind doing an up and down stroke because these are so broad. These folds broaden out so much, but everything else I'm going sideways with it. You know, I did for, I do it here. I've done it here and there, bug lips, but it's the, uh, it's the AS, I think. I don't know what the proper spelling is.
How did Mozart spell his middle name? He didn't spell it with yes, did he? You could do the same sort of thing with any of those other reds. It would just be a little bit um, different. But I, when I do this sort of thing, if I'm going up to yellow, I like to use a very warm, very warm reds. Um, and Asmodeus is the warmest dark red. Aguero, uh, it's at uh, 4.30 p.m. Central Time, USA. So 2.30 p.m. Eastern, or sorry, Western Time, West Coast, USA. It's a little late for Europe, I know. But it's my, like, informal Anne does whatever she feels like stream, so. Today it will be working on the bust. So I need to map out some stuff that I'm using as examples in the PDF that I'm doing for a special offer next month. And I'm excited that it's almost done. It's going to be like at least a 12 page PDF. It might be even longer. It might go up to 14 or 15 pages with pictures because I want to be able to show kind of a step by step. So it's uh it's gonna be beefy. It'll be my special offer for um for my Patreon. So if you're already on the Patreon and you upgrade, you get it. If you're not already a ten dollar backer, and of course you get all the rest of the ten dollar content then from the last two years as well. I'm just gonna go just little bits down the side of this fold. Oh, we got blue. My hand got too too much in the uh, too much in the frame. So this is traditional layering, where you're just putting one layer over another. You're leaving a little bit of your previous layer sticking out so that you get that blended transition look, get that fade. The only, uh, I'm using the same brush stroke. I'm just using thicker paint than I normally would because I'm going to be using more colors than I normally would. These days, uh, it's more common for me to use four to five colors instead of like in the old days when I was first developing this red, I was using like nine layers nine different colors from almost black up to uh up to up to yellow and white actually but now that's not so practical because i'm a lot more conscious of like what kind of fabric am i trying to do i don't want to bring fabric up to white unless it's a shiny fabric right so now that i'm more conscious of texture than i was back in the olden days um I might not bring it up to white, but I'd still bring it up to wherever I need it to get impact, the right visual impact. But doing the correct brush stroke, even though it's not as necessary, this brush stroke becomes absolutely necessary when you are um, you're working with paint that's got more white in it and you're doing, you know, much thinner paint and trying to still get a good blend. Like, getting used to using this brush stroke on thicker paint is a good idea. It becomes very necessary when you're doing folds and you want a smooth blend on, uh, with thinner paint. Uh, unless you're doing wet blending, obviously. If you're wet blending, you can get away with just wet blending all of this and you don't have to use the funky brush stroke. Although I find it still helps. Up, oh, I missed, I missed Derek's, uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> you do too. Yeah, we all probably pronounce it differently, right? I doubt Pathfinder has given us a, a, you know, a pronunciation key. I bet people at Pathfinder say it differently too. It's like, it's like, um, it's like D&D &D monsters, like the Chimera, where it's a Chimera, but it's a Chimera. <laughs> and people say it differently. And that one, at least, you can look up the Greek pronunciation and, like, go, oh, okay, I've been saying this wrong all these years. But that isn't the case sometimes with other stuff. Especially if it's fantasy, like, and they took it from religion, folklore, or mythology, or based it on a real name, but then they change a letter or two, right? And then you're like, well, I, I really don't know how to say it. Do your best. Just say it however. People will figure out what you mean. Uh, context, right? As long as they're D&D &D people. 
Chimpera? Is that is that the chimpanzee version of the Chimera, Pendrake? When I was a little kid, I thought it was Chimera because I was American, and that's how I would pronounce it. Until I started like reading Greek mythology, and then I realized, oh, this is actually pronounced with a hard K. Lovely. So yeah, since I want this red, to the, I want the dress to look this color. So I'm putting a lot of uh, Asmodeus on it. A lot. And remember, we got to go down the middle of this too. Now this is narrow, so I am using an up and down stroke. And that's true of any folds that are really narrow. So up here on the arm like this, when I do these folds, I'm not probably going to be doing a, a sideways stroke on it unless I've decided to suggest texture. I'm going to be doing a simple stroke on it because these are so narrow that you really can't come in sideways on them. So yeah, don't forget the, <laughs> the tropical shirt triad. <laughs> Metallica. Wow. That's, uh, that's, I mean, people will do. I mean, I pronounce some things very sillily, but that's because I'm being silly. Like when I was a kid, we would call leopards leopards. Just because it was cute. Alrighty, one more fold here and then we'll do the top. And whoa, we're way over. Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah, that's for Xandros. Xandros's tropical tropical bluishness is all um spectral spectral glow technically, I think. Right? Um there's that that's the teal, lemon yellow and void blue for the shadows. What we call the Hawaiian shirt triad because if, you know, if Xandros was in a world where there were Hawaiian shirts, that's what he would wear. He does look a lot like Magnum PI. I can't help it. My mom really loved Tom Selleck when I was a kid. He's a darker skinned Tom. It's the uh, Pacific Islander uh, version of uh, Tom Selleck. Yeah, same Inara. Like, that was me as a kid, because I, I was also a voracious reader, but I didn't, I wasn't a real talk-to-people person at that time when I was younger. Now, you can also decide, um, especially if you've thinned your red, you can decide to put a couple of layers on to build it up stronger if you feel like you're not getting the strength you need, if you accidentally thinned it a little bit too much or whatever. Some reds are really transparent. You'll see me do, do this with the clear red when we get to it. That's getting there. <laughs> By you, Glips. <laughs> oh, your mom was a William Shatner fan. Yeah, my mom was like tolerated Star Trek, but was never into it. But boy, she really liked Tom Selleck. Yes, always have an alibi, Bug Lips, so that if you have to escape from one of your like hobby communities, you can uh, assume a assume a different name and and still still hang out, but no one will know. Or, or you can fully escape and they won't know how to track you, depending on what you wish to do. All right. So as we bring this up, it's going to start, it's up here near her face, it's going to start interacting with that green a bit. It's going to be not quite as contrasty, because it's not quite as dark, but we still have that nice dark base. So it's still coming off, because we started dark and worked light, the red is going to come off darker than it would if we had started with a medium red. Um, if you start with a medium red, it's going to be a much, much brighter red, and you can bring up a dark red to that level, it just takes serious work. And probably some underpainting with some white. But here I'm not using underpainting like I was on Monique. I'm, I'm going to do it the hard way where I'm bringing up everything.
and where I'm slowly just building up the paint. I do think it gives a richness to it. Just getting some of these highlights up here, not a lot, just a little. Mostly where the sleeves are sticking out. I do love painting red. It's been a while. So we should call it because it's been a while. I didn't start that late. So we've gone late on the stream. Oh, well, it happens. Um, but at least we got there. We got all the red up two stages. So now the question is, and I was talking to Pendrick about this earlier as far as uh, saturated versus muted and how you have to change things. Um, as I pump this up higher, it is going to start to maybe conflict with her skin. So I'm going to have to keep an eye on it. Um, and see uh, how much I really want to take this up. Or maybe if I have to uh, take it like down a little bit, I might have to glaze uh, the red down a little bit here or de-emphasize some of the brightness because her skin is so, such a delicate color. So we'll have to watch that as we move forward because you have to watch the relationship between your colors. Right now it's not bad, but it is um, taking down the pink in her face like a little bit because this red is so very vibrant. So we'll see how we go. And uh, if we want to change our strategy, I'll probably bring it up and then I'll see. The other thing you can do uh, is to put like a border around the neck of the dress that separates this red from the green. Just like this belt, this, um, this leather is going to do over here. So this is going to come between the red and the green and we're not going to have problems at all. Uh, so we may need to add some ornamentation around the neck of her dress if we decide the red is getting too strong to put some kind of separation between the green, the muted green and the brilliant red. Um, you're fine watching Anne all day, but Anne's back would give out if she had to do eight hours in this chair cookie. <laughs> For these long days, the Thursday, the long day is, is uh, pretty darn long as it is. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in and watching me totally fat finger all my pinning and uh, um, totally blorf it up and... Uh, uh, then do to, to do some red, to do some pretty, pretty red. So yeah, hopefully you all are sold on Asmodeus and that you will run out and buy 89507 um, instantly. Yeah, she might be a spring. I don't know if she's an autumn big apple. Again, I guess olive skin tones, right? Actual olive skin tones. <laughs> yeah, but we'll see. And the other thing is, as we bring this dress up, we're going to, it's going to get more Christmassy, right? So then we also have to watch that. So I may very well put some sort of ornamental collar on her dress um, to take down that, uh, that where we're, where we're hitting it a little bit too hard. So, but make a note of that, guys. Remember, when her dress was more of a dark purpley red, we didn't have that. It actually looked fantastic with this. And that's because we had a muted red with muted green. But as the dress gets brighter, it's going to start to war with that green. And then we have to make changes. So good lesson, actually. It's a, it'll be a, a good way to show you how to get around that stuff, I think. So, yes, thank you, everybody. Who do we have to raid, Reaper? <laughs> You're welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Even if I get grumbly from time to time. Oh, brush for hire. Cool. That'll be fun. Awesome, guys. You all have a lovely day. And yay, it's almost Friday. Let's, let's get ready for the weekend, right? Awesome. Talk to you later.